Hello, I'm Petra Lewis, and I'm going to give you a quick tour of what class and flipping is and how to do it. Key to understanding why do class and flipping is understanding about active learning. So active learning is when your learners engage in activities that promote the analysis, the synthesis, and the evaluation of class content. And notice I'm not saying memorization here. Key to class and flipping is an understanding of what active learning is. And so active learning is when your trainees engage in some form of an activity that promotes analysis, synthesis, and the evaluation of class content. And notice I'm not saying memorization here. So this is passive learning. So this is passive learning. And this is active learning. But this is active learning. This is active learning. This is active learning. And this is passive learning. And this is passive learning. I'm sure that many of you have seen this learning pyramid before, but the basic concept is that these much more passive means of learning lead to much smaller retention of information than these much more active methods. So in the traditional classroom, the students are sitting in the classroom, they're learning information, they're learning how to do um, different processes, and then they go home, and then they have to apply them to uh, their problems on their homework. The idea of the flipped classroom is that the learners are at home learning the basic facts and processes, and then they get to apply those facts and processes in an active manner with supervision by their, their teacher. So the flipped classroom has two components. It has a self-learning component, and then it has the active teaching session, and I'm going to go through each in turn. Here's another pyramid. This is Bloom's pyramid of uh, learning objectives. And the bottom layers of this pyramid are the ones that are the lower level learning objectives. The top are the higher learning objectives. And so those are the ones that we're doing in the time that's spent with a facilitator with the lower level learning being done independently. So the self-learning component may include background knowledge about the process being studied, the scientific evidence, the facts, some basic techniques and skills on how to acquire information or process it. And now let's look at some of the resources that are available that you can assign your learners for the self-teaching component. There's a number of different cheap apps that you can use to make your own whiteboard videos on your tablet. And I use this a lot for explaining simple processes. Sites such as the Khan Academy have a very large selection of pre-made whiteboard, or in this case, blackboard videos that you can use. You can record your own short lectures. I happen to like using Explain Everything, which is what I'm using to make this particular talk. But you can record directly into PowerPoint or use more expensive software such as Camtasia. You can also record using Zoom and WebEx. This is a clip from one such movie that I made using Commonly Explain Everything. Windows are shown here. Each of these different windows aims to maximize the display of one particular set of soft tissues but at the cost of us not seeing the others. For example, here we are looking at soft tissues of the mediastinum, but we cannot see the lung. We can see the lung on the lung window, but we can't see the mediastinum. And we can see the bones here, but we really don't see the soft tissues or the lung very well. If you don't want to make your own lectures, then there are a ton of excellent lectures available on YouTube or sites such as CT Is Us. And it doesn't have to be all videos. You can assign your learners a paper to read before the session or a book chapter or assign them some modules to do on a pre-existing website, such as this one from the University of Virginia or from Rad Primer, for example. And for students, you could assign them one of the Aquaphor modules, um, such as the Aquaphor radiology ones, all of which have pre-existing flipped classrooms made already for you. So what are the purposes of the active learning session? Well, it can help in the learner's understanding of the material. It can reinforce the key points. It can help them synthesize different elements together and apply the concepts they have learned to problems. And it also helps in the file transfer of learning, which I will talk about on another occasion. Active learning sessions can be done in groups of all sizes. And for an example of how this can work in a very large group of two or 300 students, I recommend you look up some of the YouTubes of Eric Mazur, who is a Harvard physicist. Depending on the length of your active learning session, you can break it down into a number of components. 
These components can include assessment components, teaching components, when you perhaps do a five or 10 minute little didactic teaching period, and then components where they have to apply that knowledge. Pre and post tests can be very useful to help them help you assess their pre-learning. Did they do it to identify some of the current knowledge gaps and help focus your teaching on it, hence guide the session according to the student's knowledge level. It can help consolidate the knowledge learned and then overall is going to increase learning, particularly with reinforcement with the post test. For these assessments, you can use a number of different audience response systems, uh, some of which I've listed here. You can have not only multiple choice questions, but ones that require an open response, giving you something like a word cloud, or ones where you have to touch the area of abnormality. Obviously, those are great in radiology. And the responses to these can be anonymous, which students tend to love, or that you can identify the person who is responding. Also consider having your learners engage in some form of collaborative work. This really improves their engagement. They seem to have increased creativity and learning. And it really, they, they tend to feed off each other's knowledge. And I found that they really respond well to this kind of safety in numbers concept of working with somebody else. Well, I didn't know it, but she didn't know it as well. They feel better. Some examples of both collaborative and individual exercises you can do in the active learning session are uh, traditional radiology hot seat type cases, have them complete a diagram, have them complete compare and contrast tables, and I'll show you one in a minute. And then there's some more interactive concepts such as jigsaw activity or radiology games. And these can be a topic of another video. I'm going to show you a movie here of me teaching one of the aquifer uh, flipped class and workshops to medical students. So draw some arrows to show me what structures can move and where. So this student over here so is annotating over, on an iPad, which over. is projecting over to the screen so all the other students can the see it using some software called the Siri. Here's another example of a flipped classroom session. In this case, the residents had to watch some movies that I've made about breast MR as their pre-learning. We then started with a short pre-test using audience response software. I then gave a short lecture. They then had a group exercise I'll show you in a minute. And then we finalized by them applying their skills with breast MR cases, again, using audience response for their answers. And this was the exercise they had to do. They did this as pairs, and they were just comparing and contrasting various benign and malignant characteristics of tissues on breast MRI. So what have we learned through our experiences with Flip Classroom? It can be a great tool. It fosters independent learning. Collaboration is a very strong learning tool. It increases the attention of the learners, and it leads to these higher level learning skills we talked about before. It helps identify concepts which the uh, learners are struggling with. You can therefore clarify problems they're having and generate new questions as part of the discussion. One of the advantages with offline learning is that you're able to accommodate different learner curves or different learner stages. And for novices, it provides this framework for them that means you can move on to a higher level during your active session. It reduces cognitive overload for them, and it really helps when you're teaching mixed groups such as different um, years of residents or students, and enables a more um, experienced learner to be able to review the material briefly before coming to the session. What's the research on this? Well, you know, frankly, the outcomes research is limited, but there does seem to be improved attendance, some improvement in the emotive and the motivational aspects of learning, even some improvement in exam scores. Um, but we don't really know about long term learning yet. And we certainly don't know if it's going to turn out better doctors or not, but in theory it should. What are some of the challenges? Well, it's a change. It's a change for both the learners and the teachers. Developing the active teaching session takes practice and refinement. And the learners really need to learn to adapt. And initially, the attendance may decrease because they realize they haven't done their pre-learning. But then it tends to increase to these sessions because they have to be there. They have to be hands on. I have, however, used Flip Classroom as a tool, even with doing remote learning during COVID. Pre-recording videos can be challenging at first for those who are less experienced, so they didn't, don't sound very monotonal. And because this is not a didactic session, you do need to be flexible. You need to go with the flow. You need to respond to areas of weakness, areas they already know perhaps you don't need to reinforce.
On the same time, don't get carried away by the flood. You know, you've got your learning objectives. You need to try and get through them. Do limit your learning goals. You're never going to get through as many in an active learning session as you will in a didactic lecture. And again, really do not assign too much pre-learning. They're not going to do it. Keep your assignments to under 40 minutes, best videos under 20 minutes, one or two papers, preferably one, one chapter in a book, and so on. And give them plenty of heads up when this is due. Uh, you can post this on the course manager. You can email them, but also email them a reminder a couple of days before, which is when most of them will do it. And then get feedback about your sessions and modify them according to how it went. You may need to reduce the amount or reduce the difficulty or adjust the timings. But don't give up if the first one doesn't go quite to plan. This is a really good technique. They're fun to do. Your learners will like it. Um, so keep persevering until you get it right. Thank you.